Hello everyone. I'm Argamowicz, and I'm going to tell you about the last couple of years for me, because I've been a doozy. It has drastically changed my life, some for the better, others not so much. This video is going to tell my real life experiences. It isn't meant for sympathy, but maybe to try to understand what I've been dealing with and have gone through, and how I've been crawling through the muck trying my very best to survive and continue as a content creator. Here is a trigger warning. As it contains talk of cancer, death, unalivening, depression, anxiety, bullying, and more. As mentioned, it has been a hell of a couple of years. Also, if I use anyone's name in this video, please do not attack or harass them. Just ignore them. In 2020, as many of you know, I busted my ass working nonstop for months taking commission after commission to try to move out of my shitty apartment located in a very dangerous part of town. By the end of 2020, I achieved my goal of moving, but with that came this weird feeling of loss of purpose and directionlessness. Just before I moved, my aunt Kay, my mother's twin sister, went into the hospital for cancer, and I was able to visit her the day before she died. Seeing her on her deathbed hit me especially hard since my mother and her look very much alike, and it was like seeing my own mother on her deathbed. My mother lived nine, soon to be 13 hours away, so it was not an easy task to just drive over and see her. Not to mention, it was winter time and we both lived in snowy areas. I did tell her about her sister. Little did I know it was going to be the last time I'd hear her voice. Once I moved, I emailed her about my new place and she liked it, and I told her I was going to have her come up in the spring to see it. This was around early December 2020. It was the last time I ended up talking to her. I sent her a few emails, but never heard anything back. This wasn't too abnormal. There would be times where she wouldn't get back to me for almost a year at a time. We weren't super close, and she constantly would let her phone service drop and re-pick up it with a new number, and it was just me waiting to hear from her. December and January, I was pretty depressed and felt very lost as to what my goal to work towards was. I had never reached a goal that wouldn't require me to work my butt off. When February rolled around, all that changed. I got a call on the 11th from some man who got my number through my uncle on Facebook. My mother was in the ER. She was unresponsive, and her lungs were filling up with fluids. They needed my permission to drain it. As the next of kin, I had to approve, and of course I did. So much happened within the next three days. Apparently in December, my mother had trouble breathing and went to the ER. She found she had lung cancer. She did not tell anyone. She was on medication and supposed to go back, but on her birthday in January, she was rushed to the ER, where she stayed in a nursing home to monitor her. She refused to tell anyone she was related to, because to her, that would mean giving up. My mother was pretty eccentric. Back in February, the doctor talked to me about how she had stage 4 lung cancer and it was spreading fast and she would not survive the week. They asked me if I'd sign a DNR as cancer had made her bones so brittle CPR could snap her spine, and it would only prolong the inevitable. Since she was not responsive, I had to make the decision. I agreed, with a very heavy heart, because until this point, I still thought she had a chance of recovery. I have a very large family on my mother's side. She had seven living siblings, and each had kids, and most had grandkids, so it's hard to explain everything to everyone, but I did my best. My mother's sister called me. We'll call her R. She told me she called my mother's hospital, and she talked to my mother, who said she wanted to live, and I was letting her die by agreeing to the DNR. I know she didn't talk to her directly, as my mother was unresponsive, and even the nurse in the room said my mother didn't say anything, but this destroyed me. I told R that I couldn't handle this. I was a mess, finding out hours ago my mother was dying in the hospital. So I told her she could be in charge of my mother's health care. I called the hospital and let them know that she would be taking over. That night my mother died. It was around 11pm, but R didn't tell me. I got a call from the hospital at 1am asking if we decided what we were doing with the body. They assumed R had already told me that she had died, being that I was my mother's only child. I mustered all my resolve, sitting in bed, calling the funeral home to take her body for cremation before I crawled next to my husband and cried the rest of the night until I passed out about 6 or 7 a.m. I woke up three or four hours later and was packing to take the long drive there. R called me around noon or one. She still didn't contact me to tell me my mother died, but I knew anyways. I told her I was heading down to take care of my mother's things. She mentioned she was thinking of going next week. I scolded her, told her I didn't need her help, and that the way she talked to me and accused me of letting my mother die was unacceptable, and I wouldn't forgive her. I'm well aware she was scared. Her two twin sisters just died, and she must have felt like she was next. But it was no way to talk to a traumatized, grieving daughter. Once my husband came home, we took the over 12-hour drive to get into her area. I had to ID the body and get her finances together to take to the probate courts. I remember walking into her house, and I saw the chair she must have practically been living in before she died. She had a tiny little bear next to her. She had had this little bear since I, before I was born. It was something she kept in her car, and he now lives in my car. But thinking about it, the bear, the isolated chair, it was too much. I must have gone through like two boxes of tissues that day alone. 
I grabbed her bills, collected a few pieces that held sentimental value to me, on top of finding a few things to mail to family members that I thought they may like to remember her by. I had to ID the body on February 14th, a hell of a way to celebrate Valentine's Day. Seeing her, she looked so defeated and upset. My soul was crushed. It was very much like when Kay was in the hospital, and all I could think about were the words that R had told me of I let my mother die. Shortly after IDing the body, my uncle T called me and wanted to tell me how he missed his sister, and so on and so on, but I couldn't. I told him I couldn't handle that right now, I was too upset. He got upset at me and asked me why I was being a bitch when he just lost his sister, who he knew longer than I did. I hung up on him. After being stuck longer in an area because of an ice storm that closed the roads, we finally headed back. By this time, I had opened a Facebook group for my family and was giving them all the information I had. It was easier than trying to contact over 28 people who I didn't even have numbers for everyone. On the road home, I noticed that my aunt S made a Facebook posting saying how she hated the family because she had to find out my mother died seven hours after her death. This was a real kicker to me. I contacted her about how I made the Facebook group, which she ignored the invite to, and even I didn't know until later and just how hurtful that post was. She doubled down and said it was my job to tell her information and not her job to ask for it. I blocked S, but it won't be the last we hear of her. Also, after all this, only one person, a friend of the family, offered condolences in real life. None of my family members reached out to me to see how I was doing and holding up. They made it all about them. During this time, however, I did become closer with a VTuber friend. She understood what I was going through, the family blame game, the drama and such, and it was so helpful to have someone who could relate instead of the blanket statements of, that sucks, I'm sorry, it's happening. And I am super grateful for her. A few weeks after this, in the beginning of March, some people made a post on a 4chan-like site saying that I and my VTuber friends were doxing people, and people were afraid of me because I'd dox them. Mind you, I'm still dealing with family shit, grieving the loss of my mother, barely hanging in there. Apparently some VTuber, someone much larger than myself, who we will call C, was feeling insecure about something and decided to tell a person, we'll call him Red, that I was trying to cancel them. I'm not sure the exact details of how much, but Red made a post saying how C wanted to unalive themselves and it was all my fault and my friends. First of all, C and I used to be friends. We hadn't talked for years, but I did notice at one point C blocked me. I assume this was because of one thing or another, but mostly they weren't on my radar. Secondly, I didn't have their address or name to dox them. I'm not sure why they thought I ever did. Third, I have a super strong feeling about being accused of making people want to unalive themselves. I get how that feeling shows up, but to blame someone for something like that when I had nothing to do with them for years and now of all times when I was dealing with my mother's death and still grieving. I was pretty upset about all this. I made a post online about how I was accused of all this and it was false. I didn't state names. I'm sure as you know, when I talk about people, I don't usually include names, as I'm not looking for anyone to get attacked or harassed. I'm just recounting my story. Red used an alt account with a scattered of false information to make me think it wasn't him. A mutual friend contacted C, and instead of unblocking me, they emailed me saying that it was all Red's fault, how C never talked bad about me, and it was all Red's doing, and how they were unhinged. Which I do believe they're unhinged, but Red posted screenshots in their 4chan-like post that included C blaming me. C stated that they did not want a confrontation, so they didn't uh, talk to me, and apologized for not talking to me about it, but nothing about them blatantly lying to me. But whatever. This won't be the last Red attacks me. He has done it in the past with a nearly two hour hate letter to me because we used to be friends. But when the community got bigger and friend groups formed and C went with a different group and probably blamed me for things to Red, which made them hate me because they have or still have a super hard on crush for C. Even when I made VTuber keychains, I made a custom C necklace for Red because he asked for it and we were friends at the time. I had no idea he had anim animosity towards me. But he was upset about me and other VTubers playing games in a VC, which he was invited to but didn't join. Or how I didn't want to be in a VC with people that made me super uncomfortable, that said sexual things towards me, or wanted me to whisper or say lines to them in the VC. It was gross, it made me super uncomfortable. But he is from a country that blames women for distracting men if they wear skirts and dresses, so I guess what did I expect? My grandmother had a big family. She had nine kids, but they were mostly selfish. They only really thought about themselves 90% of the time. My Facebook group turned into one about my from my mother to sharing information about my grandmother. S wasn't a part of the group, but she convinced my Uncle T to give her my grandmother's finances. So for nearly 10 years, I was in charge of my grandmother's finances because she was in her 80s and struggling to keep track herself, and my Uncle T was a drunkard and would use her money to buy his booze, and they were spending more than they had and kept struggling to keep the lights on and the water going. I took over the bills and the accounts, with the approval of my grandmother. 
they had a separate debit card that I would put excess money into to let them spend on whatever, food and clothing and so forth. Years ago, we wanted to get a nurse and a companion to come to her house, along with Meals on Wheels. She had a savings account for her yearly house taxes, but they wouldn't accept her into this program because she had too much money, but just barely. She couldn't have over 1K in her accounts at any given time, but her property taxes were well over that. So my grandmother and I came up with an idea that the savings would be in my name alone and go to paying the house taxes and any extra would go for Christmas gifts, which I usually had to buy for the family. It was a little dishonest, but not really. She would have lost her house if she didn't pay property taxes, but she wasn't allowed to save for them. But I digress. So S whispered into T's ear that I was not good for this, and since I moved, I shouldn't be in charge of it. I said I was fine and gave it away to my cousin Y to take care of, as T suggested that either Y or S should be in charge, and I knew that S was shady AF. By the end of May, Y gave it back to me as T called and said Y wasn't paying anything. Y just sort of forgot. There was only one or two bills that weren't already on auto pay, and that's because the companies didn't have that set up yet. So I took it back. And yes, this is all relevant, I promise. In June, my grandmother went to the hospital three times, all for elderly neglect. My grandmother was 93 at this point. She couldn't take care of herself. The nurses and companions stopped showing up because drunkard T, who lived with his mother, was making sexual comments and harassing the visitors. I tried to encourage him to stop drinking, tried to bribe him to go to AA by paying for a gym membership that he wanted. I was going to try to help him as much as I could, but he refused to go. The goal was to get him a job, but he just couldn't stop drinking enough to get there. Anyways, after the third time where my grandmother went to the hospital after soiling herself and vomiting on herself, an elderly protective services came by, condemned the house as apparently part of the ceiling was broken, the sink in the kitchen was broken, so they were leaving dirty dishes in the bathroom sink, no one cleaned anything, the yard was full of trash, and rats made their home there. All of this happened while I wasn't around, and it was appalling. My aunt-in-law, we'll call her B, and I thought that it may be best for her to go into a nursing home. T and S were against it because my grandmother wanted to stay home. And I get that, I really do. But she wasn't being taken care of. No one was helping her. My uncle was a mess and he was keeping professionals from coming over. So after busting our butts and dealing with the backlash from S, who called the cops on my uncle R, who was B's husband, he sided with B and myself, so S didn't like that. R got pissed off at S and then the rift in the family started. Eventually, we got my grandmother into a nursing home. She was clean, she got her meds, and they had activities, but yet her family still neglected her. Because the one time I drove all the way down to visit, they said no one would bring her clothes, and I had just bought some for her, so she was living in mostly hospital gowns. I did get B to come by and bring her stuff, but let's put a pin in the family drama for now as we're going to come back to this. Dealing with that, and still heavily grieving, and I'll mention grieving a lot because I was struggling to process my emotions, and at night I wasn't sleeping. I'd be up crying, watching the office to distract from the fact that I was having constant panic attacks, thinking I was going to die in my sleep, or the nightmares where my husband suddenly died. I was not sleeping much, if at all, and constantly exhausted, and even sleep aids didn't help. It was taking a real toll on me. I had lost any enjoyment in making tutorial videos for a long time since this. I wanted to stop. Questions being asked were redundant, and I was getting nasty comments or just a lot of downvotes on videos because people couldn't figure out or didn't like my answer. I had people accuse me of stealing their ideas even though I made them years before. I mentioned not wanting to do tutorials, but people seemed to only want that. More redundant tutorials. I would still stream as a distraction, but it was quite clear that I was low energy. From lack of sleep, from the crap I was dealing with, it was a lot, and it was hard to keep going. People kept telling me to take a break, but VTubing was the only thing keeping me from feeling isolated and alone. Since I moved during the pandemic, I didn't know anyone in my new state. They were still mostly locked down, so there was no way to meet people. If I didn't keep myself occupied, I'd just dwell on my anxieties and grief. I would take short hiatuses to try to help myself, but would always return to declining numbers, which really hurt my psyche. During this time, I was going to therapy, but with so much going on, it was hard to make any headway. Like bailing out a boat with a hole, using only a spoon. Maybe it would help, but it just felt like it was sinking. At this time, I also had a Vroid server that was originally to help people with Vroid. Some people really wanted it to be about all programs for models, but I wanted it strictly Vroid, as I've watched past Vroid servers change into other programs and phase Vroid out completely. One of my mods was very vocal about how they didn't like how I ran things. I explained they were allowed to disagree with me, but not in the way they were if they were to be a server mod. This caused issues. At one point, there was issues between two members and a model. I don't remember the details anymore, but we decided to time both of them out as they weren't dealing with it properly. It caused unneeded drama. They didn't communicate clearly on either side. The former mod, because she didn't want to be a mod if she couldn't badmouth my server rules publicly in the server, got pissed off we didn't come to her because she was friends with one of them. 
We explained it had nothing to do with her, but she insisted. I and the other server owner were getting exhausted with the server. It was a lot of drama and crap from younger members. There was a lot of good information there, but the other owner was expecting a baby and couldn't be there as much, and I was so exhausted from family stuff and VTuber stuff that I couldn't handle it anymore. We had talked for a while of closing the server because of how people were acting in it, but ultimately we kept it going for the source of info. I thought we could keep it open, so I reached out asking people for mod help and was turned down. With everything else going on in my life, I just couldn't handle it. My co-owner couldn't handle it. We decided to close it. We didn't really give a warning. Due to drama and just how some may act or attack, we wanted it to be quick, like a band-aid. So we closed it down. We wrote a goodbye letter, why we were, and in the few days that the server would be gone for good. I opened a small section for Vroid in my VTuber server for any supporters, sort of like a thanks for the support to all the YouTube members or Patreons or Twitch subs, uh, to help them one-on-one. -on -one. It did cost money, but it was less than a dollar, and I would be there to help personally, which was something I couldn't do in the Vroid server with its over thousand members. I figured I could handle the few, and it would be a sort of thank you for offering support. However, this caused backlash, but only towards me. My other server owner wasn't target at all. It was Argama did this and Argama did that. I was accused of destroying all this knowledge, of trying to get people to pay me for help, which I guess in a sense answered, and to this day still answer comments on my YouTube videos. One person DM'd me on Patreon just to tell me that they were pulling their support because I closed the server, which is fine, but my Patreon has nothing to do with Vroid or that server. I got a lot of blowback from them. I was barely hanging on with everything else, the deaths, the accusations, dealing with family drama, the bullshit, and the server, and the community. I was exhausted. I needed help. And people turned me down. What else was I supposed to do? After dealing with the backlash and the family issues, I was too overwhelmed with Twitter. It was so much of VTubers hanging out, VTubers succeeding where I failed, or drama. It was causing more unneeded stress, so I made a post that I was unfollowing people for my mental health. It usually wasn't people I follow directly, but their likes and the you know so-and-so, they follow this so-and-so person's tweet. Most seemed okay with it. The follow for followers unfollowed me, and that is fine. I just needed a break from it. I would still check in on VTubers and friends to see what they were doing. I'd go to their page directly, instead of sifting through a timeline. I tried to make the timeline of art and feel good things to help ease my mind, and it helped a little bit. I'm going to touch on this fairly quickly, or at least hope to. Around July-ish, something happened to my husband's car, and we needed to get two parts replaced near the tires. We called our car guy, who had been pretty good about fixing our cars at a reasonable price. We relied on him for years and trusted him. So we called him for this, and he said it would cost over a grand for the repairs and the items. This isn't a little amount, but we knew a garage would be much more. He came over with his tools and parts, but apparently he didn't know how to repair this part of the car. But instead of telling us, he wanted the money, so he spent half the day breaking one of our tools and one of his own. By the end of the day, he left the car in pieces, left his tools, and said he needed something else, and he left. Weeks go by. He is either ghosting us or asking for more money for parts. My husband starts to get frustrated and YouTubes how to fix this car. Little by little, he's slowly getting at it. It took a few days, but when he was finishing up on the last tire, the guy came back for his tools and helped my husband put the final tire in. My husband asked about a refund since, one, he didn't give us the parts, the car guy gave us one part but then broke it trying to put it on, uh, two, he didn't do most of the work, maybe 10% tops, which was pulling off the tires and then helping put the one tire back. The car guy said he didn't have the money, he had already spent it. He would do a car work for free next time. We were reluctant, but we were sort of friends with him, so we trusted him. So a month later, my car went in for an inspection and needed some piece welded on, or welded close, uh, to pass the inspection. We contacted the car guy, and he said, sure, bring it by. So we dropped off my car, and he asked for money for it. We reminded him that he promised to do it for free, since he never paid us back for the last car stuff. He said, at least needed money for the parts in the garage rental. We reluctantly left some money and drove the almost two hours back home. A few days later, he said we could pick up the car, and we did. I took it back to the inspection, and it failed. He never welded the item. He used some quick fix temp tack something to try to fix the problem. And when we tried to contact the car guy, he ghosted us. When we asked for a partial refund on the car stuff, he ghosted us. His ex-girlfriend contacted us. He got into this new girl and some drug shit, so he's no longer our car guy. Around November 2022, he contacted us begging for money at 1 or 2 a.m. We ghosted him. Late in the summer of 2021, my grandmother is in the nursing home. To get her there, we had to agree to sign over the house to them. They would claim the property to cover the costs of my grandmother being cared for, and her social security was going to be switched over to them by August or September. So my uncle T needed to move out. I was still in charge of the finances at this point, so I made sure the taxes would be paid off for that year and the bills for the next month. I gave the rest to T on a debit card that he held on to. I told T to use the money to get his license, which he needed money for, and to fix his car, and to move out, as they would be kicking him out soon anyways. 
granted, it was only $1,500, so he wouldn't be moving anywhere nice, but that's all that was left. He seemed compliant on that, but said something about R and B trying to get my grandmother's safe, which had her coins in it, and they wanted to steal them. For context, my grandfather bought a bunch of half dollars and dollar coins decades before he died in the 90s, in hopes that one day they would be worth something his kids could inherit. Honestly, they weren't worth much. The best ones, maybe 50 bucks, but not really. This was always an issue with her kids, and I suggested one year to give them out as Christmas gifts, like an early inheritance, to stop the drama, but my grandmother said no, so we never did. Less than a month after this, my Aunt S decides she wants to play hero and break my grandmother out of the nursing home and put her back into the situation she was in. At this point, she went to my grandmother's house and took a safe and had it broken into. I had the safe key and was given it by my grandmother. My grandmother never trusted S and didn't want her in the will or have the key because she was very much all about the money. S decided she wants to become the power of attorney, which B was at the time, and have control of the finances, which I had. She never asked me for the finances. Instead, she called a lawyer and accused me of stealing $4,500 from my grandmother. I was flabbergasted. I had no idea where she got that number from. I did learn in one month since T got the $1,500 that he spent over 900 of it on booze. I talked to her lawyer and told him if he was working for her, he was a piece of shit scumbag. I also stated I never stole any money. The most I had was property taxes set aside, which were admittedly slightly behind to be paid. And this was mostly because I had changed banks and I needed to go into the checking account to be paid online and my bank had to talk with the other bank and then wait for the transfer. And then approve sending the payment via debit card. And since it was over my daily limit, it was just like a whole thing. But I digress. It wasn't $4,500. And while that was going on, she got my grandmother to agree to give her power of attorney. My grandmother has had dementia for a while and it's only gotten worse. But with the promise of getting her out of the home, my grandmother agrees and B loses power of attorney. And by September, my grandmother has been placed back into her house with drunkard tea and no one to care for her. I was pretty pissed off, honestly, but nothing I could legally do. The most was inform elderly protective services that she was placed back into the house and to do checkups on her. As mentioned before, I was in therapy and went over a lot with this with her. Together, we decided my family was too toxic and I should cut them out of my life. All my life, I've always catered to them, trying to get approval from them. I was often neglected and ignored unless they wanted something. They would treat me like shit and insult me, but yet I allowed it. Because of them and my mother, I have crazy abandonment issues. My mother was terribly abusive, which made my grieving so weird for me. She would often beat me and insult me, and when I was a kid, I'd be isolated for days at a time while she worked. When she came home, she just wanted to relax, and I was more of a burden. When I was bu bullied in elementary school, I'd tell her about it until one day she told me I wasn't allowed to talk to her about that stuff anymore because it caused too much negativity. So I didn't have an outlet to talk about my problems that I was dealing with. My extended family on my mother's side treated me like an outcast. My mother told me, she told my father the day that I was born about me and he said he's going to pretend I didn't exist. So I had a lot of abandonment issues. I would go out of my way to help my family for them to accept me. I helped my grandmother with a lot for a while. I would take care of her finances, her shopping, or just do it myself. Help her out around the house a bit, file her paperwork, take her to places she wanted to, set up doctor's appointments, and take her there. The problem was my grandmother, for some reason, always got my name and Y's confused. The names are not similar at all and we look absolutely nothing alike. It's just something she did. So when talking about things getting done, she would say Y was doing it. And it made it really hard on me because the family accused me of being lazy and not helping enough. Even though almost every moment I wasn't working, I was helping out. Which is more than anyone else in the family could ever say. As an adult, my mother and I didn't get along when we lived together, but were okay on the phone. She would call me when she wanted to, and since she was always changing her number, I just had to wait for her. Once it was over a year before she contacted me. There was one time when I was sexually assaulted, and I didn't tell anyone. In fact, this may be the first time I've mentioned it publicly. I told her, and she said if it ever happened again, not to tell her, because she can't do anything about it. I was upset when she died, but confused. She was a terrible and unsupportive mother, and to this day, I still hold contempt towards her for the fact that she knew she was dying, and never once did she call to talk to me. She didn't even have to tell me she was sick, but just let me talk to her again. So between how she treated me and how the family treated me, there was a realization of how bad things really were and how I normalized the abuse in my head and confused it with caring and love, which it wasn't. So it was decided I would cut them from my life. Mostly I did. I still have contact with our son, Junior, and B, and they're the only decent people in the family. However, this was hard on me. The holidays were coming up, and everything I saw was about family and being there and how family is there for you, and God, it hurt. My mind told me that I was a piece of shit because they wouldn't care for me. Some of the family cared for each other, and most thought Y was a golden child, even though her own kids won't talk to her and she mostly is just a wine and weed lady. I spiraled hard. I knew family is who you choose and not who you're born into, but coming to terms with the lies I told myself about their abuse and how it affected me and molded me into this untrusting, scared and lonely person. It was clear their treatment 
is why I go above and beyond for strangers in the VTuber community, even allowing myself in uncomfortable situations and let people walk all over me and my undefended boundaries. As the year closed out, I was in a pretty bad headspace. 2020 and 2021, and a lot of 2022, I didn't go out much. Due to the pandemic, I stayed at home a lot. Being in a new area, I had no place to go. I mostly sat at my desk working. I was losing my stamina. My health was deteriorating. And in mid-2021, I injured my rotator cuff. And it felt like it was on the mend, but the injury would be inflamed when drawing. I decided I wanted to get better. With some money I had saved, I decided to use to buy a treadmill. Setting up the treadmill, I ended up re-injuring my rotator cuff. I started walking in short bursts to help bring back my stamina, but I noticed I was getting a pinching on my chest near my armpit. I contacted my doctor, and she started to prescribe me some medications for it, an inhaler, even though it wasn't my lungs, and set me up with a cardi cardiologist appointment. In 2021, I had set up an appointment with a neurologist because every so often I would smell things that weren't there. My previous doctor thought it was a migraine aura, but those are pretty rare, and said that I should follow up with my new doctor. However, getting a neurologist appointment, uh, it was rescheduled time and time again until about March or April. I didn't really worry about it, but my spring and summer of 2020 were test after test. I'm going to divide this into three sections as it's very confusing chronologically. <laughs> Last year when I was seen for shoulder pain, my doctor thought it was because I slept on my side and she sent me to physical therapy. I did it for months, but my shoulder was just in constant pain, whereas normally it only hurt if I put it in a weird position. After stopping, it started to feel better until I re-injured it moving the treadmill. I let my doctor know about this. She resaw me. She said it was pinched and sent me to get an MRI. They said it wasn't pinched, but torn and sent me to an orthopedic surgeon who said it wasn't torn, but there was a pouch that was inflamed and it was being rubbed. And they sent me back to physical therapy. And I did that for a while until I told them that I did all of this last year and none of it worked. So they discharged me. And here I am still with pain in my shoulder. The reason the rotator cuff is brought up is because this kept me from drawing. I love drawing. Drawing is life. It kept me from working on Vroid and other commissions. There are projects I wanted to work on, but can't because of the pain. But honestly, no idea what to do at this point. I do my best not to sleep on it, but it is what it is. The cardiologist. This one isn't too bad. I had some tests done. I ran on a treadmill, had an ultrasound. It was fine. I was cleared to treadmill it up. Neurologist. So trigger warning on this one. I went to the neurologist and they told me the smell was either seizures, brain tumors, or the auras. Auras being super rare, they didn't think it was that. They did an EEG and saw something that may be a seizure, but they weren't sure. They put me on anti-seizure medication and scheduled me for an MRI for the brain tumor. But there was a rarer side effect of the drug, one that made you want to unalive yourself. I was pretty depressed and anxious already. I was still dealing with coming to terms with the family stuff, feeling unwanted, and little bits of drama in the VTuber community, including Red reposting literally the same post from March of 2021, but in October of 2021. <laughs> I was mentally struggling with the medication. It put me in such a state to not feel bad and as dreadful as I did, that unaliving sounded like it would be such a nice release from the pain. Not that I wanted to be unalive, but I couldn't handle the thoughts. Mind you, I was on this medication for only one day. I talked a lot of the night through with one of my VTuber friends. It got super real to the point where I was preparing my goodbyes. I sent messages to people that I appreciated them, and in my mind's eye, the next day I was going to do it. Towards the end of the night, and I'm not sure why, but my mind went into... Could this be from the medication? I looked it up and it was a side effect. The pharmacy never mentioned it because it wasn't a common side effect. I decided I wouldn't take it anymore and see if it changed how I felt. By the time I was in bed, the more and more I felt it was because of the medication. So I sent a message to my doctor on our portal saying, I think the medication made me want to unalive myself and I won't be taking it unless you advise otherwise. It was about 2 a.m. when I sent this. Hours later, I finally fell asleep. I woke up at 8 a.m. to the police looking for me to make sure I didn't unalive myself. Even just sleeping that much wore the effects off, and I couldn't believe how close I came. I had not had such thoughts since I was in high school. Ultimately, it was a relief, but after talking with a doctor, he now inferred that the only thing left it could be is a brain tumor. I was utterly panicked and freaking out. I always struggled with the idea of death, even as a child, and with my mom dying and then the nightmares and the panic attacks of my own mortality, I freaked out. I was in a horrible mental place thinking I had a brain tumor and was dying. I wasn't sleeping much beforehand, and it went out the window after. I would only sleep if exhaustion took me over, and then I would be up after the bare minimum. When I finally got my MRI, I was told it I would know in a few days, only to find out my doctor had taken the days and week after off. So I spent two weeks as if I had a walking death counter over my head. Thankfully, when I did get to talk to him, it came out clean. I did not have a brain tumor. I did get a follow-up with another neurologist who doesn't think it's anything but a migraine aura either. So after all this, I realized I wasn't in a good mental place. Everything was taking its toll. I did enjoy VTubing, but I felt it was too easy for me to continue with my old habits of catering to people and allowing them to walk over me. I was trying to assert my boundaries by asking people to limit where they asked v questions to the point 
when they kept asking questions on Twitter, even though my profile has, for over a year, stated don't DM me questions, I threatened to block people. I did a collab for my four years as a VTuber with a bunch of people. It was nice. I made some new friends. I mentioned my pseudo-graduation. The idea was I was going to work on a game with my husband and VTube on the side. We were planning a game type and a story and were, was working out some details and I was going to learn to do some of the coding. But the problem arose that my arm couldn't draw the assets and that was my driving force behind it. We also decided later on the felt that the game was a bit too much of a, another game's clone, which in honesty it wasn't really, but we had another idea in the reserves. But trying to sit my husband down to work out the details is hard. The project has been backburnered until my arm gets better and we can work a rough storyline. <sighs> I almost made a video on this alone, but strap in. At this point, it's been a few months. I'm still struggling to recover from not only dealing with the emotions of the shit of last year, but the idea that one, I almost killed myself. Two, I was under the impression I was going to die because of a brain tumor. I was so rarely happy, mostly overwhelmed with anxiety and depression. I spent most of the year and some of last year in this void. I called it the fog. It felt like you're walking in a thick fog and you couldn't see where you're going. You didn't know if there was anything anywhere, but you know that the things around you don't spark joy in your life. It was depressing and nothing seemed to help. You want these things that you used to love to give you feelings again, but they don't. Energy is just sucked from you. All I wanted was anything to stir something positive and joyful in me. I had seen a trailer to Hogwarts Legacy on Twitter. I've never played a Harry Potter game, but Harry Potter holds a special place for me. I have very few happy memories with my mom. One was one day we went to the movies and it was the opening for Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I fell in love with the story in the series then. She enjoyed it too. For the next two movies, we saw them on opening day. We had to move for the fourth when it came out and the theater was over 50 miles away, so we weren't able to see it on opening day. Even when I moved out, I watched them on opening weekend. It's just a fond memory. Even the fact that I'm Argama Witch was because of my love of the series. Seeing the trailer sparked a bit of interest. I had interest in it before because a fellow VTuber whom I was friends with back in 2019 was in college for game development and I had learned they got to work on this game personally. I think it's even his first game, so I wanted to be supportive because I was very proud of him. Now before I go further, I need to address some things. I don't like JK Rowling. I don't like her views and opinions. I like Harry Potter's the series, not the author. I am a believer of separating art from artists. I like Marilyn Manson's music, but not him or his domestic abuse. I like Disney mu movies, but not the anti-Semitic classism Walt, or some of the company itself. I like the idea of Lovecraftian monsters, but not the racist himself. Nikola Tesla created a lot of amazing things, but he had done some shady shit and possibly anti-feminist women and ultimately body shamer. I also know that JK Rowling is technically a billionaire and the vast majority of her royalties come from book sales and theme park sales. At least 25% of her income comes from the book sales and movie sales alone. Merchandise brings in money too, but nowhere near as much. I know her yearly earnings are still in the millions, but have dropped from 95 million a year to 60 million in 2020, but by no means is feeling a pinch. I am aware of where she spends her money, but I also know that even if all royalties stop, she will still have enough money to keep supporting whatever she wants for the rest of her life. This is not an excuse, but this is just a statement of fact. I also don't personally believe that she wrote goblins to be anti-Semitic. I think it's more of goblin lore and she used it. But in the 40s, that same lore was used to depict Jewish people. I think it's just an overlap with lore and not a hate-inspired thing. This is more of a theory, as she's never really gone on anti-Semitic rants. Although she has liked Kanye tweets and he's anti-Semitic, but the tweets she liked I don't think were. I, I don't know per se. That being said, the original idea of goblins being anti-Semitic were brought up by Jon Stewart in a podcast in which he said it jokingly. Newsweek took it out of context to write a sensationalized piece in which Jon Stewart himself made a public video saying that he didn't believe any of that. It was a joke. He, as a Jewish man, loves the series and thinks Newsweek was in the wrong for misquoting and taking his words out of context to make sensationalized articles. That being said, seeing the game on Twitter, there were a lot of don't support Rowling bootleg the game, the devs already got paid which Twitter likes to try to oversimplify complex things they probably know nothing of. Sure, devs got money, but that money was borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, and Peter will want his money back. Not to mention, any money made would go towards future projects. Bootlegging the game will hurt everyone who worked on it more than it would hurt Rowling. Not to mention, the game has been in development since 2017. They paid for the rights to use Harry Potter then. Rowling didn't start liking questionable tweets until the late 2019, and it wasn't until 2020 she began to be openly gross and spewing her opinion on trans people. At this point, the game was three years into development and two, three from COVID delays from releasing a complete game. 
The devs and the creators of the game have publicly stated they did not agree with her views, and she has nothing to do with the game, and apparently ha even have a transgender option in the game, as a not-so-subtle fuck you to Rowling. It seems like it was a passion project of the devs. So I made a passive tweet. Most of my tweets were pretty sad or depressing because of all the bullshit, and finally something piqued my interest. My tweet read as followed. I don't like JK Rowling's opinions. But Harry Potter holds a special place for me. It's one of the few decent memories I have with my mom, and I would like to get the game. Pirating the game will hurt the developers, and therefore the jobs of all those involved, so I won't pirate it. With my limited numbers of characters, I thought I got enough information through. I don't support her, but I understand pirating the game hurts the everyday person more than it helps her. And if people wanted to have a discussion with me on it, I was up for it. However, one of the comments was from a VTuber we'll call D, who replied with, and I quote, Cool. So care to explain why transphobia and anti-Semitism are excusable for the sake of your own personal enjoyment? At first, I was going to reply in an equally aggressive manner, as this was very accusatory and aggressive. Instead, to stop myself from it, because it was only going to escalate, I decided to follow my therapist's advice uh, that she had been giving me to remove people from my life that would only cause you pain. So ultimately, I just blocked her. I had made follow-up to my tweets about not supporting Rowling, and if it hurt or bothered my trans or Jewish friends, I'd reconsider getting the game. I did also ask some of my trans friends, not all of them, but some, and my Jewish friends about getting the game. If I got it, would they feel betrayed by me or hurt? They all said they didn't care if I got the game. Some were even interested in it themselves. However, D decided me blocking her was an admission of guilt and started a call-out post about me being anti-trans and pro-turf and anti-Semitic, saying I put my childhood whimsy before marginalized people. People on Twitter are hive-minded, and it's hard to reason with them if you want to have an actual adult conversation. They are happy to have their fingers in their ears going la-la-la instead of an open discussion, which I'm always up for. And I did have someone. Someone talked about how they felt the series was anti-Semitic, and I saw what they were saying. I also knew a lot of what they were saying was exactly what Newsweek had stated, and it probably hurt more from a Jewish perspective. I asked my Jewish friend and my Jewish therapist about their thoughts on it, and neither really saw it as being anti-Semitic and didn't feel hurt or threatened by the depictions of the fantasy creatures, even if Nazis did use propaganda 80 to 90 years ago with goblins being labeled as Jews. But suddenly I received a ton of backlash. People were calling me transphobic, a turf supporter, anti-Semitic, selfish, even pro-slavery. People were reporting me for hate speech, the tweet that I said I'd like to buy the game on. I lost tons of followers and friends too. That little spark I had, a little bit that reminded me there was something good in my family that I was clinging to, got flushed. I was bombarded with hate. Anyone who called me transphobic, anti-Semitic, or whatever, I blocked. I was so distraught. It felt like the last little bit of anything I had, not the game, but being a VTuber, being in the community. It was like, it was all that I had barely holding me together and it was gone. A few people sided with me knowing me and knowing that I had no malintent. They know full well I don't support her and anyone who knows me growing up knows that I was an equal rights advocate. Hell, I even had, and to this day extent have, gender dysphoria and used to balance between non-binary, female, or just male. This is something I've experienced since I was about eight or nine years old in the 90s when it wasn't something you really heard of. I didn't know transitioning was a thing or an option until I was even in high school. I'm not one who would support someone who is against allowing people to be and feel comfortable as themselves. Either way, being the target of cancel culture in my state of mind drove me over the edge. I was struggling to communicate with my husband what my needs were in the state of mind, and instead just drove to a deserted parking lot to unlive myself. I'm fairly against unliving oneself. Sure, there are specific cases when it's a medical mercy, but I'm mostly against it. For others and for myself. Like a few months prior, my first thought was to say goodbyes to those there, and then end it. I wrote a few in Discord, but for one friend, and I'm not really sure why, I called her instead. Maybe it's because she's not active in Discord, and I've never really emailed her. I almost texted her, but we haven't sent texts in a while. However, I couldn't keep my composure, and instead we talked for hours. She was in the middle of cooking dinner, but was there for me. I may talk about what's going on to those around me, but I try not my best not to cry, as it makes them feel uncomfortable but this time I couldn't stop. She ultimately talked me out of it, and after I hung up with her, I spent some more time sitting in the car alone in the empty parking lot in the dark. Weeks to months after this, I had terrible anxiety. When it came to streaming or being online in general, I was afraid to do anything, say anything. I was so fearful anything I said would be taken out of context or twisted perversely to fit some narrative. Many times I'd have panic attacks before planned streams and would just end up canceling them due to fear. A lot went through my mind the next week. I was also leaving on a trip, so that started with a bad taste but I did find my mood was a bit better after getting away from things for an extended weekend. It allowed me to work on cleaning the slate, 
When I returned, I got COVID for the first time ever. The sore throat and coughing coughed, but I slept. I needed that sleep. I don't think I've slept that much in the whole year as I did during COVID. However, the COVID cough did cause me to strain my back and pull a muscle, which kept me bedridden for a total of three weeks, including having the initial COVID. And then when I was starting to feel better, I got a seasonal cold. I was sick for almost the entire month. I did, however, feel very well rested and came to a decision. I decided I wasn't going to be as active on Twitter anymore. Yes and no. I'd post information of what I was doing, like streams or commissions, but I'd log out and stay logged off. For my mental health. And since I wasn't going to be around much, I refollowed the VTubers I unfollowed. Unless they unfollowed me during the Harry Potter thing. Since I had commissions, and now doing a giveaway at the time of writing this, I'm more active on there. But once it's done, I'm logging off again. I found myself able to breathe much better off of it. That being said, there's still some residual drama sparked by the DVTuber. Somehow I keep crossing paths with messages about me from somebody who I blocked and they have had me blocked. I wasn't sure if I wanted to touch on this, but I think I do. I'm airing out shit, so this is just something I've been wanting to talk about for years, as this person who keeps blaming me for their own bad actions. And being that the DVTuber and others who went on a hate march against me are siding with this person, I just realized what bad taste these other VTubers had. So bear with me, we're on the drama express for this one. Usually when I talk about people in the drama, I don't bring up names. I don't want them to get hate or backlash. Mostly I'm just telling a story. That being said, this person has no problem name dropping me and blaming me for their actions, so I have no problem doing it either. Again, I ask, don't harass or bother this person. They are sad and pathetic enough as it is. I'm only bringing this up to finally stand up for myself as I usually stay quiet as they've talked shit about me. What to call them? They keep changing their name because I keep fucking up. But it was Jaded Target, and then Subliminal Starlight, Mayuri Hoshino, and now it's Lunse Kaffir. I'll be using them as they change in the timeline. In 2019, I was friends with someone named Jaded Target. But he did some shady ass shit. Such as asking a watermelon VTuber if their urine tasted of watermelon. He would donate and dump a lot of money on VTubers and use that as leverage to get them to do what he wanted. He would know someone was in a hardship and using donating money they desperately needed as means to worm in and guilt them into hanging out with him, making things for them, and so on. In 2019, things were really kind of gross towards this watermelon VTuber and I didn't approve of it, but justified it as they were pushing boundaries and didn't realize they overstepped. I have seen a few people not understand boundaries in the community. I talked to him and talked to the victim too. She and I were also friends at the time. I realized how some of her actions were giving mixed messages as she was agreeing to hang out with him even after him saying such, making him think it was okay when it wasn't. But she did that because she felt obligated because of the donations. It was an utter mess. I wasn't trying to get into the middle, but both were friends, and I saw Jaded as someone who didn't understand social etiquette and cues. Later on, I found out that he harassed many girls, including prominent V Shoujo members. In fact, people were coming forward with how uncomfortable he made them. It was a real issue because no one was communicating and thought that maybe it'd be best if we had a place to talk about stuff like this in a safe environment, so we were informed. In theory, it was from a place of good intention. But eventually, after years, the place devolved into the did you hear sharing VTuber drama. Once it became like that, I wanted to close the place, but instead left it to somebody who wanted to take it over. But that's beside the point. Jaded has, at this point has rebranded into Subliminal, who was still a fan at this point, was still making people uncomfortable, including myself, with holding donations over people's heads. I'd have an easier time standing up for others than myself. But if I heard about him stepping over boundaries, I'd talk to him about it. It was so he could keep himself from going too far and having the community blow up at him. That being said, he did make donations or even boost my server and asked me to make more emotes when I didn't have time because he didn't want to waste his boost or how he wanted X type of merchandise. And since he bought my merch, I should make what he wanted. Even once, when I was doing a subathon giveaway, I tried to give away a new art book in a standee. Uh, there was a drawing from a list, and anyone could enter, but those who subbed got more entries. I was giving away five or six things, maybe more. But every time I drew something, he would get all dramatic, and it made me and the chat feel super uncomfortable. So much so that I ended up fudging one of the winnings to be in his name. He accused me of letting him win, and I lied and said, no, for real, he won. And he finally calmed down. I tried to do nice things for him for being such a supporter, like drawing some art, but he would say distasteful comments like, would it look better if I paid for it? It was pretty ouch. I was even working on a test model for him, as it was something I hadn't done in Vroid yet without charging. He wasn't a VTuber at the time, so it was fine. However, one day, Subliminal upset somebody with I was sort of friends with by bringing up a topic they were purposely trying to avoid as a non-binary fluid androgynous VTuber. I talked to Subliminal about how since it didn't concern him that he shouldn't have brought it up. Subliminal snapped and yelled at me saying, I gave you nearly $200 and you're just like, bitch, you're a fucking sexist. Which I did not say that at all. I just said that the VTuber was very upset. However, that was the final straw for me. All I ever did was try to help him avoid more drama from the community. 
It was not my fault. He would constantly stick his foot in his mouth or say inappropriate things. But I was telling him why it was and how to avoid it. But once again, he brought up money. I never asked for a donation. I appreciated it, sure. But I wasn't going to let him try to control me because of the money. He mentioned wanting to help me out and wanting and him wanting to belong, which I get, but how he was going about it was wrong. And it wasn't just once or twice, it was many times. So finally I was just done. No matter how much I said I'd be his friend and had nothing to do with the money, he didn't have to buy or sub to me or anything. As his friend, I would stand up for him when he fucked up. I'd take responsibility and try to sue things over with the other VTubers and tell them I'll talk to him, try to get him to correct his behavior. I think the only people, I think the only reason people were giving him a chance to hang around is because I was going to bat and I was trying my best to give him chance after chance. Basically, he didn't like that I would tell him when people were upset with him or when he fucked up and was on the verge of getting on people's bad side. Instead, he wanted me to prostate myself and thank him over and over and over again for buying merch and donating, which I did thank him every time, but it wasn't like the start of every conversation. I told him I was kicking him from my server. He could return, but he would be treated like a fan and not a friend. I wouldn't have his back when people were leery or upset with him. He wasn't blocked, but I didn't want him to sub or support like he was and expect anything in return. If he did it, it was to support my- A month after that, I had finished the model I was working on and I did give it to him. No strings attached. It was, we were friends, I finished it, no hard feelings type of thing, have a good life, enjoy being a VTuber or whatever. About four months after that, one of his tweets came across my feed and it was very sad and I was worried, so I reached out to him saying, even though we aren't friends anymore as humans and someone in the community, I hope that he feels better and that things will get better. He rejoined my server at this point and everything seemed fine. I had a video scheduled for release where I talk about my time as a VTuber and there was a passing mention of people holding their donations over my head. It was about him and a few others, but he took it personally and left and blocked me everywhere. Apparently in the months from when we stopped being friends to when I reached out to him to make sure he was okay, he was going around telling people I was canceling him, that I was getting my friends to ban and block him and the truth was, I made one mention in a server that I wasn't his friend anymore, so I wouldn't be standing up for his actions anymore. That was it. It was practically lost on that server, but the people but people didn't notice I wasn't defending him. So I suppose they did what they did and blocked him for his actions. But he blamed me. He kept going around telling people it was my fault and I was trying to cancel him. I learned about it two months after I had reached out to him and about a month after he had blocked me. Every new VTuber he met or would friend he would lay in about what a horrible person I was and how I tried to cancel him. So enough was enough. I contacted him on my alt account with a basically, clearly we aren't friends, so could you not use the model and artwork that I made for you as a friend? He didn't pay for it. They were free gifts. It seemed pretty hypocritical to use free gifts I gave him. So active. So I asked him to stop. He blew up in a server about me that I was a part of. I stated I was just asking him not to use my gifts if he was going to talk shit about me. Uh, his constantly shitting on me didn't stop or slow down. Some of his friends even contacted me for my side of the story since apparently he talked about me all the time. Oh, I mentioned my side and they'd say thank you. I also suggested I didn't think the VTuber community was a good fit for him. I didn't think he should lose his friends, but overall it did not seem healthy for him. Some agreed. One even contacted me later saying how he did the same thing to them and they had to block him. And it made her realize just how he liked to play the victim. I once went into a stream of some friends and he was there. I was going to leave, but it seemed like he was leaving instead, so I stayed. And then he proceeded to cuss me out, so the streamers banned and blocked him. I went to the streamers afterwards and said they didn't have to do that. I'll just avoid their streams since he is more supportive monetarily. They told me they weren't going to be accepting of that behavior. This was my last interaction directly with him. All of this was in 2020 and the end of 2019. That being said, he still constantly makes posts about me, lies about me to other people online. And this includes to the DVTuber tweet where D sided with him and others that accused me of the now Lun Se shows up in these posts saying how I canceled him or tried to when I did no such thing. I only brought them up once by name, and it was to a small group of friends saying that I wasn't his friend. I didn't tell them to stop being his friends. Even his friends, I said they should keep them. I just think that the community brings out the worst in him. Countless women, he has made super uncomfortable with how he talks to them and how he tries to manipulate them because he can support them financially. I, again, bring this up because years later he is still bad-mouthing me online by name and never publicly have I used his name stating how he treats me or other people, but enough is enough. This was more venting to get off my chest, and I'm sorry, this is already a long video, but I needed to. We are starting to get closer to the present. November, I get a text from my cousin saying that my grandmother has passed away. She was found dead on the floor. From what I pieced together, my uncle found her after coming home from getting booze. I was sad, but I felt I had grieved for the family loss already, so it didn't impact me as bad. My cousin, Junior, said S was trying to pay for the cremation but couldn't afford it. I chuckled a bit to myself. I could be malicious and let her pay for it even though it's been paid off for over a decade. When my grandmother was lucid, she had me help her prearrange everything. 
She planned it and we agreed on things with the funeral home. It was all paid in full. Ultimately, I didn't hide it from S, even though I hate S and I really only hate two people in this world, S and someone I nicknamed Chupa, but thought S would make the family pony up money for it. Even though I cut them out of my life, I still stepped in and told my cousin it was prepaid. My cousin Y lost her shit when she found out there was going to be a cremation and no service. She complained, there will be no funeral because there's no money and they're going to burn her at the stake. My family is so dramatic. I had a message sent to her that this is what my grandmother decided and she needed to calm her tits. At this time, I also found out that after S got my grandmother out of the nursing home, she got her to draft up a new will. Apparently, in the event of my grandmother's death, the house will go to S now. Originally, it was supposed to go to T until we signed it over to the nursing home, but I guess since she was only there for a few months, they didn't take it. And S decided all of this while my grandmother had dementia. She took advantage of her. Ultimately, there was a moment where I was like, okay, but they aren't my family anymore, so I shouldn't care. That was until Junior texted me and wanted to wanted me to know that S thanked me. My initial reaction was fury and anger. I did not want S to think I did anything for her. Not after how she treated me during my mother's death, nor how she accused me of stealing, nor of her taking advantage of my grandmother's dementia. I was livid, and I needed to somehow let her know that I did not do any of this for her. This may be a hard thing to understand why this upset me so, but it really did. I contacted a friend to help me compose a reply to her. Another friend also found out, and both of them told me I should just walk away from this, but I honestly felt I couldn't. I felt out of everything I needed to say something. It was a gut reaction. It was something I just knew I needed to do. Although it really hurt that neither were supportive in that I needed to do this and kept trying to talk me out of it. Ultimately, I didn't listen to them. I'm kind of glad I didn't listen to them. I wrote a message back that said, Anything I did was for my grandmother's sake, as, after how you treated me last year, I would never do anything for you. You can keep your thanks and know that I have nothing but disdain for you from now until your last breath. I wrote this late at night, and by the next morning there was this feeling a great weight had been lifted off my shoulders. It was like I was finally able to tell her off for what she did. It was super cathartic, and the weird anxiety and stress about my family felt like it had finally resolved. That was in mid-November, and I'm still glad I sent it. I'm the type of person that if something is bothering me or I'm treated wrong, it's hard to just walk away and let it wash over me. I need to address it to the person that bothered me in hopes to resolve it or resolve it somehow. By letting her know, it felt resolved. It felt all this anger I held for the past two years was able to be released. It's like having a rock on your chest and it's hard to breathe, but finally having it removed so you can take a deep breath. And this brings us to today. This wasn't everything that happened to me, of course. I left out about getting a dog that I got attached to and then having to give him up. About how I lost some half-hearted friends and other VTuber drama and crap that I've dealt with. But these were the major things that impacted me. And it wasn't all bad. I got closer to friends. And I made new friends. I had my first vacation in four years. And even if it was just an extended weekend trip that ended up with COVID. During all of this, I watched my viewership fall, and it's understandable. I've dealt with a lot, and through most of it, I was pushing to keep going. And it's really hard to be on and happy and engaging when life keeps beating you down. But I never gave up. I'm still working on myself with therapy, audio, self-help books. I'm trying to make and defend my boundaries, albeit poorly. It's still something very new to me. Reflecting on my past and realizing the abuse I normalized, and being able to recognize that is a good step in the right direction. Cutting out my toxic family and telling S off lifted a weight off my shoulders that had been weighing on me for many years. As far as the future, I'd like to continue to work on myself, even if that means not doing as much VTubing. Or maybe it means more. Who knows? But I do know that I feel more hopeful now than I have been. And I would like to thank you for listening to my story of everything I've been going through for the past two years. And I know it's been some heavy topics and some rants, but it means a lot to me that you're here for me and that you continue to support me through all of this. I appreciate you and thank you.